Hey y'all, good to be with you on Wednesday here again for devotion and prayer and, and some talk about regathering again. Uh, one of the things that is uh, probably the biggest pain point in uh, the really f exciting and exhilarating reality of beginning to physically regather on Sunday mornings uh, is the fact that we are not yet singing corporately. And uh, the Lutheran tradition, among all traditions, I think has to be at least as steeped in congregational song as any tradition. Uh, maybe the Moravians have us uh, by a nose there, but um, we're we're so um, our identity is so wrapped up in the idea that when we come together to praise God on a Sunday morning, uh, we do that um, in song. Right? I don't know if that's the primary way we do it, but it's among the primary ways that we do it, and. Um, having a continued inability to do that together on Sunday mornings, even as we've re-entered the worship space, is really painful. Um, it's requiring a lot of continued patience, and uh, we feel like maybe it would be helpful to share with you some of the sources that we're looking at that are both um, unfortunately, but also fortunately, pretty clear that um, continued waiting before singing corporately indoors uh, is a faithful move. Um, we're looking, I'm going to share four sources. These are going to be in the comment section below so that you can review them. And I'd invite your conversation about the way you read them. Um, I also think I'll risk saying I invite any sources that you're seeing that might speak uh, to the contrary of what these sources say. I'd love to see them. We're looking hard and we're trying to find ways to be at peace with singing together because we want to so badly. Um, we do want those sources to be grounded in uh, good science. Um, but if you've got them, please do share. Uh, the four that we'll put down there come from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. They just released um, updated guidance for worshiping communities a week or two after the CDC um, released all of the new permissions for vaccinated people. So these are up to date and they still um, discourage indoor singing. Uh, they talk about possibly singing outdoors, I think. Um, but they discourage indoor singing. Um, there is a group called the Center for Congregational Song, and they've got a really good list of questions to ask ourselves as a faith community, but um, they tend to land on um, still being really careful and avoiding um, corporate singing indoors. Uh, the CDC has a, a graphic that talks about um, singing in a group especially indoors as the highest possible risk level of an activity that folks who are not vaccinated um, can do. And then there's an ecumenical group that the Lutherans have been a huge part of, um, but also the Episcopalian Church and the Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church. Um, and it's called, uh, this particular iteration of their work is called basically care-filled uh, sacramental life in a lingering pandemic. Um, and they're really clear that singing is uh, not to be done indoors at this point in the pandemic. And, and that whole document is really thoughtful and grounded in ecclesiology and theology. And I invite you to read as much of that as might be helpful. Um, and they're trying really hard to encourage us um, in our patients. Uh, they know how hard this is. Um, we all obviously know how hard this is. Um, so just wanna say that um, the reason we are not yet doing that, we're asking ourselves questions like, um, how do we create a safe and welcoming environment for the single dad and his young daughter who walk into 11 a.m. worship next week? Um, is it fair to, that, uh, to those people that they might come into a space where um, maybe unduly risky behavior is taking place when the young girl, let's say she's five years old and she doesn't have access to the vaccine. We're also really aware that uh, we have no longitudinal evidence or studies on young kids who get COVID-19. Uh, and there are variants going around and all these kinds of things. So in the face of all of these unknowns, um, church leadership really feels like, um, especially with the guidance of these four really trustworthy and expert entities, um, it's really hard to not uh, comply with their guidance. Uh, the only reasons we can come up with is because we're out of patience or we want to sing so badly, which are both um, in some ways valid, but 
we just can't quite be at peace with potentially putting God's children uh, at risk because of our desire to do something um, like that. It's This is a really uh, hard time, and this is a really hard thing to have to wait on. And um, the hope is that the Spirit will give us strength and stamina to stand with um, those who are most vulnerable. And those who are most vulnerable in this context are uh, particularly children under the age of 12 who don't have access to the vaccine uh, and anybody else who's unvaccinated for any reason. Um, and we know by the numbers that there's quite a few folks out there who aren't vaccinated for whatever reason. Um, so we have to assume uh, a lot of unvaccinated participants are in our worship services and as such, um, how should we behave? What is God calling us to do and to be about? in our worship. Uh, so again, we're going to put all those links down there. Um, I invite you to read those. Um, be in touch if uh, you're reading them differently than we are. Um, and, and send us any um, scientific studies or anything that you might know of that we haven't uncovered yet, because we have been looking and we'd be thrilled to, to see some more things to weigh as we continue this discernment. Uh, John Jar is always up to date on these things and um, you know there's a robust dialogue within the community of professional church musicians about where we should be in this and what we should and should not be doing and there are some ongoing studies that we're waiting to see uh, results on so uh, we're paying attention to those and waiting for the results and um, eager to see you know if, if we can feel good that singing um, is safer than uh, the experts seem to think at this point uh, will change. And this is a fluid situation. We're always trying to pay attention and to um, pivot and adapt in the ways that are faithful. So um, we're so encouraged to be with you on Sunday mornings. It's so good, especially for me to be seeing so many faces, uh, many that I've seen a lot and some that I've never seen until I saw have seen you in person. So um, thanks for coming and being a part of it. And um, all of that is just really, really joyful. But we're also really aware that it's not yet what it will be. Um, so we'll pray here in a minute for continued uh, patience and discernment together. I'm going to read a little bit um, from Luke's gospel here. And this is at the triumphal entry um, where Jesus is entering Jerusalem. This is basically Palm Sunday. And um, it says, As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. That scripture came to me, I think, because I can have a real sense of urgency, like, Oh man, God needs our praise. <laughs> and that's um, not true, ultimately. It might be truer to say we need to praise God. Um, and, and certainly singing is such a primary way that we do it, but we're continuing to praise God in all kinds of ways um, in our worship services. And uh, that just helps me to remember that God, uh, if God needs song, God can make stones shout out and sing praises to God. Um, and, and certainly, we're trusting that what is more perfect to God, what is more pleasing to God, is um, doing everything we can to maintain love for our neighbor uh, and safety for those who are most vulnerable around us. Um, also, uh, was reminded today that you know we can sing in the car on the way home from church. We can sing in all kinds of places in our life. Uh, we can sing in households when we're with people that uh, we know and uh, trust are vaccinated. It's just a different ball game in a worship service, which is a public setting where we just can't verify the vaccination status of everyone and thus have to assume the presence of unvaccinated folks and the risk that that continues to uh, perpetuate among us. So I appreciate you listening to this. I uh, appreciate you hanging with us. And um, again, here for dialogue as we, as we continue to go, but really promise you that we are working hard and trying to keep abreast of all the latest information. Uh, and we're praying and, and trying to follow the spirit and doing the best thing we know how to do in this place. So uh, let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for uh, the gift of worship and praise, the gift of community, the gift of 
uh, combining these things again in some more substantial ways. Uh, physically gathering on Sunday mornings is a joy. Uh, and yet, uh, we also still need your Spirit's grace to be with us. Uh, we need the fruit of the Spirit, things uh, like patience. Continue to inspire our worship and inspire our church leadership as uh, they and we discern together uh, what it means to be faithful in such a liminal time as we emerge from this pandemic. Uh, we pray that we would be um, indeed a sanctuary, a safe, welcoming, and embracing place uh, for the least of these in your kingdom, which include us. Uh, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. God bless y'all, and uh, we'll talk soon.